Right. Hi, Founder fans. Jason here. Welcome to Founder of the Day Week in Review, where I will be discussing the last several founders on Founder of the Day. Now, I'm going to take a quick time out because my AC just turned on. And I'm going to go turn it off. Pardon me. All right. Hi, Founder fans. I apologize for that inconvenience uh, and someone popped in as soon as I ran out hopefully uh, you make it back I'm a few minutes a few seconds ahead uh, I forgot to turn off my AC when I started and then it popped on right at the beginning of the show so let's get to the American Revolution I will note I am using a different program than I have in the past hopefully you like it just the same I am gonna note uh, my I realized the counter didn't count down because I've switched programs um, and brought in all this stuff from my old program to make the transition easier therefore I have to do something with the timer to make sure it works uh, please let me know if everything else is working right this program should be a lot easier crisper cleaner a lot more fun and with that being said let's get today's first founder shall we founder number the first and it is the federal farmer now the federal farmer as you may know is not a person it's an anti-federalist paper as I do every single Friday uh, I am on Federal Farmer number eight. Look out for number nine to be published tomorrow. Federal Farmer is, of course, uh, probably Melanchthon Smith from New York, though we do not know for certain. That being said, the Federal Farmer number the eighth, uh, the eighth observation, as they say, is a lot of fun. It, it's one of the more fun ones I've seen. He actually does a long form comparison of uh, contemporary England to ancient Rome. As you may be aware, the American founders were pretty much infatuated with ancient Rome for uh, several reasons. But the Federal Farmer actually points out that most people considered England to be the freest country in the contemporary world. Uh, in fact, it was the, that freedom that the Americans were fighting for during the revolution. They weren't saying, this is tyranny, we need to get rid of it. They were saying, we've had freedoms as English people, and we want to fight for our rights as Englishmen. Now, fighting for their rights as Englishmen led them to leaving England and becoming Americans for exactly those rights. And the federal farmer is, of course, arguing for preservation of those rights. Now, it's interesting. He starts off talking about England. He talks about how England had these certain rights in the past, and, and they were the people were accustomed to having certain rights even before the Norman invasion of England. Back when they were sparsely populated feudal system in the Middle Ages, uh, the, the Black Death may have been killing lots of people off, but that meant that people were a little more free. Uh, not to get too far out of American history here, but because of the Black Death killed off so many people that it made labor more valuable. If 9 out of 10 blacksmiths die, well then that one blacksmith that's left, uh, his services are needed and he can charge a price that's more fair. He couldn't necessarily just be eliminated by whatever king was around at the time. His services were extraordinarily valuable. And because of that, uh, during the Middle Ages and before the Norman conquest of England, which is when uh, certain continental people came up and took over uh, what was England, before even Great Britain, uh, their, their, that gave them a certain amount of freedom that wasn't seen pretty much anywhere else in the world, at, well, in the European world at that point. Now, because they had these certain freedoms, when the Norman Conquest came, they wanted to fight for those freedoms, and they did. And eventually, 
having known freedom in the past led them to fighting for freedom in the future. They would go on to uh, get the Magna Carta established. The English would go on to uh, turn their monarchy into a constitutional monarchy. Uh, they would press for certain bills of rights. Eventually, they would establish the House of Commons and the House of Lords. And that's really where the focus is for the federal farmer. He actually talks about the benefits of nobility, as you see next to me. Uh, I know it sounds a little crazy to our American ears to see, to, to think about the benefits that nobility might present, but when you have the type of structured government where you have a monarchy, uh, a king, a, a chief executive, if you will, uh, whose powers are limited by a constitution, when you have uh, a nobility, you can have a house of lords that represents the elite, and then you have the House of Commons that represents everyone else. Now, when the United States Constitution was created, it was essentially created in this image. Of course, the president was not supposed to be a king. Uh, his powers were supposed to be even, or her, their powers were supposed to be even more limited than that of a monarchy, even in free England. But the Senate was supposed to represent the House of Co Lords, and the House of Representatives was supposed to represent the House of Commons. The thing is, in England... I should note, not just the federal farmer, most anti-federalists and even federalists, pretty much everyone recognized at the time that there was what they called a natural aristocracy, by which they meant in a free country, certain people are going to succeed more than others and certain people will rise to the top. In fact, uh, there will be people who make more money and get more power than other people. The way European countries with monarchy handled this, they had nobles. And the nobles, excuse me one second, choked on myself real quick. I'm sorry about that. The nobles were nobility. It was an official title, and you were held as a noble above everyone else. And therefore, the House of Lords in England was really only representing the nobles. At the same time, the House of Commons was meant to represent regular people, and they did that by forbidding aristocracy or noble people to be members of the House of Commons. Therefore, the House of Commons was made up of regular people. Now, this is what the House of Representatives was originally intended to do, be made up of regular people. But again, Federal Farmer is arguing in this anti-federalist paper that although that is on the surface what's intended, that is probably not what's going to work out. And he does this by referencing, after discussing England and English history, as we just did, he moves on to Roman history. As I said, the American founders were kind of infatuated with ancient Rome and ancient Greece and how they handled things back then. Uh, certain Roman leaders were better than others, <laughs> as you might imagine. Now, the argument Federal Farmer makes with ancient Rome is while they like to call it a republic elected by the people, its structure was different. Now, it did have a consul or a well, basically a monarch or, or a chief executive. Uh, they had a little more power than even the monarchs of Europe, but uh, th the setup of the government was similar. They had, just like there's a monarch in England, there was a consul in ancient Rome. Just like there was a house of lords in England, there was a senate in Rome. That's where the Americans, wink, wink, got their name from. And then just like the house of commons, there were tribunes, I believe they're pronounced, in ancient Greece. Now, the problem is, while the tribunes were supposed to represent the people, much like the House of Commons, there was no official aristocracy to separate the people from the Senate and the, how, the, the tribunes. Therefore, uh, additionally, I should say, additionally, there were less people in the tribunes. So there were only you know, about 10 tribunes. So there was only a handful of people that got into that lower house of the ancient Roman government. Now, because of this situation, there were certain people who were very wealthy who were not put into the Senate, but still wanted power that would find their way to be the leader of the tribunes. And those people, because they had the time and finances to make their names more popular, even back in ancient Rome, they were seen by the people and therefore elected elected by the people, and they went and took over power. Because of this, the people in the tribunes had much more in common with the representatives in the Senate than they did with the people at large they were supposed to represent. And the federal farmer brings this point forward because he asked the question, what do you think the House of Representatives will be more like? What do you think the United States government will be more like? We don't have official aristocracy, which 
he's saying, you know, he's not saying is bad in any fashion. In fact, in other papers, including the one I'm going to publish tomorrow, number nine, he outright states that uh, we we don't want a monarchy. The certain people promoting the Constitution are the ones who want aristocracy over here. <laughs> um, uh, and we'll leave that to tomorrow's discussion or next week. Um, but the the federal um, federal farmer is basically saying that without the official aristocracy to separate those elected to the Senate or the House to the House of Representatives means that people elected to the House of Representatives, while they should be like the House of Commons, chosen from the people by the people as members of the people, as opposed to the elite or the natural aristocracy. Uh, what the federal farmer predicts happens will happen is that it, the people in the House of Representatives are going to basically be just like the people in the Senate, just not quite as powerful. I'll leave it up to you to judge whether or not the federal farmer was right on that particular account. Now, uh, that in essence is the little history lesson that is federal farmer number eight. Number eight is actually one of the most fun anti-federalist papers I've come across. It's a very fascinating argument. It's a really interesting way to look at the U.S. Constitution by comparing it to the two governments that were most compared to at the time of the American founding. England, of course, because that's what they were accustomed to, and largely not only was American common law already based off English common law, but literally the constitutions of the United States were based off, uh, the colonial charters were based off the government of England. The Constitution are not that far removed from it. They were not very similar to ancient Rome. Though I do want to note, like I said before, we call it the Senate, just like ancient Rome did. That was propaganda. That was a publicity stunt. That was done on purpose to reference ancient Greece. <laughs> I'm sorry, Rome. Ancient Rome. Uh, the, the, just Propaganda is not a new thing, I will remind you. Uh, not to say it's good or bad, it just is. If you want to sell people on your product, you got to make it uh, sellable. Which, by the way, speaking of sellable products, I have an announcement coming on Saturday. I'm actually going to make an announcement tomorrow during trivia, which sadly will be a little late. We're going to do trivia about 9.15 Eastern tomorrow, but I have a little announcement. I'm very excited about it. Uh, but we'll get to that later. Uh, that's the Federal Farmer. Let me know if you have any questions. It's just a lot of fun to look at the differences. And, and really, basically the Federal Farmer is saying the only way for this Constitution to work the way you're saying you want it to work is to both create an aristocracy, an official one. He's not saying we should. He's saying that's the only way this will work the way you think it's supposed to work. And as always, add more people to the House of Representatives. It's just not enough. Uh, but that he gets more into that in the next uh, number nine. So let me know if you have any questions for that. Meanwhile, we're going to move on to Man Page. In fact, we're going to move on to the Page Brothers. Now, Man Page is the first of the two brothers we will be discussing this evening. Uh, Man Page, uh, his brother's name is John Page. Man Page has the cooler name. Um, oh, got a question before we move on. When the Constitution was ratified, were the signing representatives appointed or elected by the people? I was told they were appointed. Um, when the Constitution was ratified. Okay, uh... First of all, Mark, thank you so much for watching, and thank you for asking the question. Uh, if I'm understanding what you're asking, when the Constitution was ratified, the signing representatives, uh, are you asking about the individual ratification conventions? Uh, because there were, you know, 13 separate ratification conventions. Um, or do you mean the inaugural members of the United States House and the Senate? I will answer both. Uh, the House was elected. And the Senate was appointed. It wasn't until the Constitution was amended. I don't know. Is there an amendment? I think there's an amendment like 17, 18, somewhere around Woodrow Wilson. I believe there's an amendment where the senators are elected. But if not, uh, it naturally came about that each individual state was supposed to choose its senators. They were supposed to be statesmen. They were supposed to be the elite, the natural aristocracy. Uh, since they wanted statesmen... You elected people to your state government, and one of the things you entrusted them with was choosing your senators for the government. Uh, now, that slowly fell out of vogue over time, and it is up to the states to determine how, or at least was. Again, I feel like there's an amendment, but I can't remember which one it is. Uh, but it was 
up to the states to choose how they selected senators and who they selected. Uh, and slowly but surely, each state started letting the people choose the senators also, uh, in addition to the House of Representatives, and then that just became policy. I do believe there was an amendment. Please let me know if you know which number it was. It's going to bug me uh, to make it official, but it had already happened before the amendment was sent through. Uh, as for the ratification conventions, uh, those people were elected. You, uh, I believe it's written in the Constitution that that's how it's supposed to go, but uh, what happened in practice either way is uh, each state would have an election, kind of like if your state's ever had to revise its Constitution, had to vote on that, um, you, they'd have an election for representatives. You'd vote on a representative to go to this convention within your state. Those state representatives would debate and discuss the Constitution. They would have a vote amongst themselves whether or not to ratify. Uh, so it's like a little mini government that they would set up to decide whether or not to accept the Constitution. Um, uh, they were elected by, those people were elected by the people. Um, there are exceptions. Rhode Island famously had a referendum, which is the Constitution literally says you have to have a convention. And Rhode Island was like, no, Rhode Island didn't go to the, ra the Constitutional Convention. They didn't have a convention. They had a referendum, which is a popular vote. Uh, voted it down. I think they had two or three referendums until eventually they were like, well, everyone else has ratified it and we're little Rhode Island over here. I guess we're going to be coerced, as some might say, into accepting this constitution. Though, uh, we'll save the conspiracies for another time. <laughs> Thank you for your question, Mark. Um, uh, and let's talk about the Page brothers. So Man Page definitely has a cooler name than his brother John Page, who we're going to get to in a second. Uh, uh, Man with two ends. I'm assuming it's a family name. Truthfully, I didn't dig too far into his family history. He has a very interesting position. So he is already in the, um, the, the House of Burgesses, which was the name of the... So the Constitution is void. No, no, no. According to the Constitution, you only needed nine states to ratify it for it to work. Theoretically... After New Hampshire ratified the Constitution, it went into effect, and those states were part of the Union. Uh, what was it? New York, uh, Rhode Island, North Carolina. Uh, I forget who else was still left over. Technically, they could have, or I guess we could have, never joined the Union had the Constitution still go into effect and just had these other little nations hanging around within its borders. Would have been strange, but plausible. Had the Anti-Federalists gotten their way, certainly New York would have remained not a part of the country. Uh, which, again, it sounds now nowadays it's tough because New York is very liberal, but at the time it was kind of the conservative way to go about it. <laughs> um, anyway, anyway, uh, Man Page. Man Page was a member of the House of Burgesses when the uh, little revolution started in the United States. Uh, his younger brother was friends with Tommy Jefferson, as we will get to. He was a little bit of a mentor to several younger American founders. Uh, he ends up when the revolution goes, uh, goes a little awry and the government is dissolved by the royal governor. Uh, as with many other states, the representatives met anyway in a quasi-legal shadow government. And Virginia called theirs the Virginia Conventions. Uh, um, they were called very things, provincial governments, uh, revolutionary. I, I, mostly, usually it's provincial government would be the name they use. Uh, but either way, assemblies, conventions. He goes to the first Virginia one, uh, and he is part of the group that signs the Association of Members of the Late House of Burgesses. Now, the Association of Members of the Late House of Burgesses is one of my favorite names to say. It's essentially um, a resolution. At the time, the cool thing to do when you were upset at what was happening uh, is to file your grievances officially. You would meet with a local group and file some resolutions and send it to your representatives in the government. At this point, the, the colonial government itself had been dissolved, so they all met on behalf of their constituents and wrote this protest. Now, this essentially was the first call, one of the first calls for the first Continental Congress. It's not the first call. It's usually claimed to be the first call, though the week before Pennsylvania had sent a letter out and days later, Massachusetts would send a letter of its own throughout the colonies. So essentially within two weeks, three the three most powerful colonies 
at this point, New York would soon overtake Massachusetts and then everyone else. But the uh, three most powerful colonies, within two weeks, and really unbeknownst to the others were doing so, all sent out calls to have a convention to, fi- to, to resolve their grievances, just like it had happened nine years earlier at the Stamp Act Congress in New York. It had worked one time. Wouldn't, why wouldn't it work again? So they send that out. Uh, and, it, and first of all, I do want to note that they call it the Association of Members of the Late House of Burgesses. Now, at the time, they used the term late to mean recently, like lately. Uh, though, in our modern ears, it sounds kind of like the royal governor has murdered the House of Burgesses. And after its funeral, it was the late House of Burgesses. Uh, I just find that funny. So they put out this call. And what happens? A continental... Uh, association happens. And Man Page is one of the people who signs that document. Um, a lot of people sign that document. You know, you got your jo- run-of-the-mill George Washington signing documents like that. Uh, now, as for Page, he basically plays a supporting role for the rest of the revolution. He never really leaves Virginia. Uh, he does correspond with, and and as an older member, uh, give guidance to people like Thomas Jefferson, George Washington, Richard Henry Lee, Patrick Henry. Now, what's really interesting about Man Page is while Thomas Jefferson is governor, so after independence is declared, middle of the revolution, uh, there is a slave named Billy. Now, I don't know his last name, uh, probably didn't have a last name, and I'm not sure who his, uh, the, the master, the, his enslaver was. Uh, but Billy runs away uh, to join the British army because the British, is, the British are promising slaves, if you come fight with us, we'll free you which to varying degrees would be true after the war. Now, Billy runs away, but he is caught and taken prisoner, and he is sentenced to death. He is accused of treason. He's tried and accused of treason and sentenced to death. Now, as we know, a trial for a slave was a show trial, uh, and uh, he was going to be hung uh, for treason. And then Man Page comes along, and Man Page decides to defend Billy's actions in the strangest possible way. He claims that, he does not claim that Billy shouldn't be tried for treason for the right reasons. He claims it for the wrong reasons. In hindsight, we know now. He says that a slave was a person, but because of their position of servitude, they were also property. So first of all, Executing a slave would be the government destroying someone's private property, which is not something we really want. Again, their words, not mine, just to clarify. Um, (laughs) uh, Not something we want. But additionally, because they were raised in servitude, they could not assert, an enslaved person could not understand the weight of their actions uh, to a large degree. This is actually later on one of the arguments for gradual emancipation. Most states, especially in the North, that liberated their slaves during and after the American Revolution uh, used used gradual emancipation, which I know nowadays seems kind of cruel, but at the time seemed to be the best way to go about things. The idea of gradual emancipation is you end slavery now for all babies born right now today, but anyone alive today won't be freed for a decade or two. The idea is we need to teach the people alive and, more importantly, raise the next generation of enslaved people in a free society and educate them on the responsibilities of being a free person. Uh, again, in hindsight, sure, you're born free and you can learn how to do whatever you want. You're a free person, right? But uh, at the time, this was seen as the most humane way to do it. Instead of just taking uh, enslaved people and throwing them to the wolves, so to speak, uh, this is your way to integrate them into society and, and make sure they are given every opportunity for that equality of opportunity that we're supposed to have in this country. Uh, I've gotten a little off topic, but uh, Man Page uh, comes along and says, well, you can't execute Billy. He's just a slave. You'd be destroying someone's property, and he, he can't be responsible for his own crimes. And so this goes through a series of appeals, and eventually Man writes to Thomas Jefferson, uh, who's governor and one of his old, I don't want to say protégés, but one of the younger men who Page had advised in the past. Uh, and Governor Jefferson actually agrees and pardons Billy. Now, we don't know what happens to Billy after this, like most 
enslaved persons. He went back to servitude, uh, unfortunately. Uh, and then Man Page passes away just later that year, even before uh, independence is achieved in the Revolutionary War. So kind of a strange guy, not the most famous founder, a little bit of a weird story uh, compared to what I usually talk about here, but I think an important one to understand uh, a lot of how the founders, especially in revolutionary Virginia, uh, viewed the ideas of slavery and, and to get some perspective on their thoughts. So I hope you enjoyed that. Why don't we talk about his brother, uh, Johnny, though he probably went by not Johnny, <laughs> John Page of Virginia. And as you see next to me, he would be a governor of Virginia. And I apologize. Some of the images are not very clear on this. I tried something new on some of these this week when publishing them. Uh, I blew them up real big, but that did not... Uh, it made it grainy. So, whoopsie daisy. I fixed that for, for, I went back to how I was doing it. Troy, what's up, Troy? Right man in the right place in time. Well played. I think, well, while I spill my water, I think what you should have put a comma there because it's last name, comma, first name, and then it would be right man. <laughs> anyway, let's talk about Johnny P over here. So, John Page, as I was saying, Man Page was a little bit of a mentor to Thomas Jefferson. He was also a mentor to his younger brother, John Page. John Page went to the College of William & Mary, as many founders did. Oh, wow, there's more people here than YouTube is telling me. Uh, Ashley, before I move on, do you know for the argument, um, do you know if the argument for not killing slaves because they were a property was used any time after Page? Um, so, this was executing slaves for... Um, uh, the government doing it. Uh, of course, you know what? Even in private hands, uh, it was frowned upon. Could you get away with uh, murdering one of your slaves? Yes. Um, slavery, and okay, preface, not justifying, not apologizing for uh, bondage in any nature. That is not who I am. Uh, but looking at it at the time, Slavery during the American founding was different than even during the Civil War 80 years later. Uh, the cotton gin would make things very much differently. And a series of rebellions, both the Haitian Revolution and a series of rebellions in, the, uh, in America would lead to, I guess, what you would call crackdowns on, on slave revolt. Not just revolts, but slaves like meeting and going to church on Sundays and things like that. Uh, I, and I, I don't want to get too into that now because that's a whole conversation in itself. Uh, but uh, you weren't... Slaves were looked at like children. <laughs> slaves were looked at, unfortunately, like women were looked at as children that needed to be taken care of uh, and disciplined heavily. That being said, uh, you were supposed to take care of them. Uh, and, and it was kind of your duty as someone as one of the elite, almost as apparently the elites today are supposed to take care of the rest of us in a weird fashion. Now, let's not get into modern politics at all. I obviously don't, not obviously, I want to make it clear, I don't believe that's how it should work. Uh, you weren't really going to justify killing anyone. Uh, of course... I'll put it like this. If you burn down your own house today, you're going to prison. Now, that's your property, and you should be able to do what you want with it. Theoretically. But there are certain limits as to what even you can do with your own property. Uh, so, no, I'm sure there were, but none I'm aware of. You know, those would have been minor court cases over the years. This one I ran into because I found Man Page and was researching his life. Uh, as opposed to, I honestly wouldn't even be sure where to look to find uh, those particular court cases. I'm sure I can go to like old courthouses, court records uh, throughout things. And I'm sure there are people who do, if you find anyone who does that and wants to come uh, do an interview over here, I'd love to dig into that. Uh, but I'll be honest, I don't know a ton about that particular question. Uh, it is my inclination to say no, uh, no, generally not. And the argument wasn't so much we shouldn't execute him because, well, no, it was. It was like a double argument where, like, he couldn't be 
since he shouldn't be tried for treason, he couldn't be executed. And then the like, he's also property. It is a great question, Ashley. Well done. You stumped me. <laughs> you stumped me. Uh, we'll, we'll have we'll have to do a research session to figure that out. Anyway, I was actually thinking about maybe doing a live like research session. Well, uh, if you guys are interested, we could pick like someone to learn about. We could do a deep dive. You could see a little bit how I do my research using the computer, which is where I do most of my research. Um, anywho, let's talk about Johnny Page. So John Page goes to William and Mary. He makes friends, and one of those friends is a young man named Thomas Jefferson. He graduates the same time as Thomas Jefferson and becomes a lawyer the same time as Thomas Jefferson. Now, they go back to their separate homes, but they are friends forever. And in fact, when you read through some of the letters between these particular founders, uh, it's really interesting. Most of the 1770s, you see uh, John Page always addresses Jefferson as my dear Jefferson. And then you often see Jefferson address it. Uh, in almost every letter, he chastises Page for not writing enough, to which Page starts almost every letter to Jefferson. Sorry, it's taken me so long, man, but do you remember there's like a revolution <laughs> happening? Did you, did you overlook that? Uh, so Page, just like his older brother and his friend Thomas, uh, gets into the... Um, uh, he serves in the revolutionary government, and when independence is declared, when his buddy writes that little declaration over in Philadelphia, uh, a new constitution is needed for the new state of Virginia, and John Page is one of the people who, has, who writes Virginia's first constitution, and then almost immediately is elected as lieutenant governor of Virginia, the first lieutenant governor of Virginia, serving under Patrick Henry. Uh, after the maximum three years allotted by the constitution Page helped write, uh, he and Henry leave the office, and the office is then taken over by Thomas Jefferson. And uh, Page goes back to the House of Delegates, which is the new assembly in the state of Virginia. He spends most of the 1780s there. Now, it's interesting. Uh, he is elected to, a, to the Virginia Ratification Convention for the United States Constitution in 1788. And while he's there, he has a change of heart. He first goes as an anti-federalist, and he does not love what's happening. But then, like many other people, he is convinced after discussions with uh, Edmund Randolph, George Mason, uh, Henry Lee, other delegates there, he actually ends up changing his mind and deciding to support the Constitution, despite the fact that he believes there are some necessary amendments that this document must have. And he writes to Thomas Jefferson, who I'll remind you, has been in France at this point for about five years, has missed the entire process of writing the Constitution, as did John Adams, and he writes to Jefferson saying, listen, my dear Jefferson, I uh, don't love what's going on here, but, and I'm going to actually quote the document, and he says, I, he's talking about the Constitution when he says it, I wish it might be adopted without losing time in fruitless attempts to make amendments, which might be made with more probability of success in the manner pointed out by the Constitution itself. AKA, it's going to be really difficult to amend the Constitution before we ratify it. It, believe it or not, would be easier to um, approve the Constitution, elect representatives, have the representatives write amendments, have those amendments sent to the states, have two-thirds of the states ratify them, and make them law. Then to put up a fight, as he calls a fruitless attempt, at the onset. Very interesting change of heart from a, uh, a pretty important guy who has already been lieutenant governor. And then by the time uh, about a decade goes by, then Thomas Jefferson's back home. He becomes secretary of state. Then he comes and becomes president of the United States. And about the time he's president of the United States, John Page is then elected governor of Virginia himself. Uh, almost 20 years after he was lieutenant governor. Uh, he holds it for the maximum three years. Uh, he is governor during some trying times. Uh, Gabriel's Rebellion, which is one of those, uh, one of the more important rebellions we were discussing about slavery earlier that erupts. Uh, it's just about the time he's governor. Uh, and then when he's done, he retires into the position of United States Commissioner of Loans for Virginia. He's supposed to oversee a substantial portion of the federal finances in Virginia. Who gives him that job? Well, you know, his buddy Thomas Jefferson, who, as I said, at that point was sitting president of the United States. So it's a pretty brief overview of John Page. He's actually a really important character to the American Revolution, despite being very obscure. You know, like I said, not a lot of people were both lieutenant governor for three years and governor for three years 
uh, 20 years apart. So he's there for the whole thing. Uh, and, and like I said, his friendship uh, with not just Thomas Jefferson, but many other families, Patrick Henry, uh, Richard Henry Lee, even George Washington. You know, he was among that group of Virginians that threw the revolution and created that state's government. Why don't we party on to our next American founder, who is Benjamin Hawkins. Now, I haven't spoken about Benjamin Hawkins in a long time. Benjamin Hawkins gets a lot of overlook because he goes not just west, but southwest. And uh, the west is very much overlooked in the American Revolution, and the southwest even more so. Although we've been talking about a lot recently, especially with Wilkinson and Aaron Burr, I feel like we've brought up a lot. Uh, with the, the problems with Spain and the future Mexico. Excuse me one second. Thank you for whoever gave me a like. <laughs> I see you. So Benjamin Hawkins is one of many, several people, and I actually put this out on Twitter, seeing if anyone knew, because I've realized in the last, like, three weeks, I must have covered four different people who, in 1775, we're studying at Princeton and left college to go fight in the revolution. Off the top of my head, uh, it was Henry Brockholz Livingston, uh, uh, Aaron Burr graduates about that time, James Madison graduates about that time, um, uh, Jonathan Dayton, who was the youngest signer of the Constitution, uh, blah, blah, blah. I see another like, thank you so much. And Benjamin Hawkins. So there's this whole slew. As the British Army is traveling through New Jersey before the Battle of Princeton, uh, a whole bunch of students at Princeton bail and join the Continental Army. Uh, Benjamin Hawkins is one of these people. He goes out. He uh, actually joins George Washington's staff. I should note, he was from North Carolina and went all the way to Princeton for school because it is was an important school, that important a school at the time, called the College of New Jersey, though, at the time. He actually leaves and joins George Washington's staff. So Hawkins, despite being a teenager, has mastered several languages. This is very helpful when some French guys show up to help George Washington. George Washington doesn't speak French, and they don't speak English. Benjamin Hawkins speaks both. And Benjamin Hawkins acts as an interpreter for George Washington for several, for about two years, uh, eventually between Henry Lawrence, uh, sorry, John Lawrence, Alexander Hamilton, and then eventually the Marquis de Lafayette. Hawkins isn't really needed that much anymore. Um, and he is kind of pushed aside for some of the other younger guys. Uh, he ends up going... He's not... I, I shouldn't say he's pushed aside, but he's not as vital anymore. And he's actually elected to North Carolina's House of Representatives in its new government. Uh, and at just 27 years old, uh, he, 24 years old, he goes back to North Carolina to serve in the government. And at 27 years old, he's sent to the Continental Congress. And he spends three years in the Continental Congress. And this is those middling years where a bunch of younger guys are showing up to the Continental Congress and realizing, hey, wait a minute, this isn't working very well. And by younger guys, I mean Alexander Hamilton, James Madison, Tenge Tillman. <laughs> um, they'd make changes later. Now, Hawkins, because he'd mastered so many languages, he actually could speak several Native American languages. And it's in this situation that he is sent to the Southwest to negotiate treaties with the Native Americans. Uh, he spends a significant part of the 1780s there. Uh, I believe the area is now Georgia. Primarily, he negotiates with the Creek Nation, which is uh, very hostile to the Americans. Uh, he is actually a part of, it's usually called the Treaty of Hopewell, but technically it was three treaties. Uh, I believe it was the Creek, the uh, Cherokee, and the... Chickasaw, I believe, are the three. There were three C names, three C names, and I apologize if I said any of those wrong. I'm going off the top of my head with that. Uh, but these treaties of Hopewell uh, did attempt to establish peace in the area and did a pretty good job for a while. We'll get there. Uh, while he's out there, uh, he is actually chosen as... Uh, I'm sorry, the, the United States Constitution is ratified, and Hawkins is sent to the... North Carolina Ratification Convention, the second one, uh, where they actually ratify the Constitution. And as such, he is elected as an inaugural member of the United States House of Representatives. Now, he is an anti-administration party, as anyone elected from North Carolina was going to be. Uh, he wanted to keep the government as small and not federal as they possibly could. He is there when it starts to turn into the Jefferson 
Jeffersonian Democratic Republican Party, whatever you'd like to call that party. While he's there, uh, he, uh, excuse me, while he's there, eventually he's chosen by North Carolina to become a part of the United States Senate. As his time in the Senate is winding down, George Washington, or before it actually concludes, uh, George Washington appoints him as General Superintendent for Indian Affairs. Now, side note, the name of this position is still Superintendent of Indian Affairs, which feel like that should be updated a little bit, but that's neither here nor there. Uh, either way, he essentially became a foreign minister to the Native American tribes especially in the Southwest. Uh, the, the Native American nations were treated as independent nations at this time. That's why they made treaties with them. It was, they were separate countries. Much smaller at this point, now that there was a little bit of federalization in there, but separate countries nonetheless. He goes back to where he's already made these treaties, and he really, he remains there for the rest of his life. He builds a plantation, which, yes, he does own slaves there, uh, which I don't want to overlook, but his... A lot of people own slaves, unfortunately, not as many people, uh, negotiate with Native Americans. And he does uh, really work well with them. In fact, uh, the Creek convince him to take on a Creek wife, which assimilates him into the tribe. And he is actually part of the Creek nation uh, by their own standards. A little bit of a bug flying in my life over here. Uh, now, that does not mean that uh, he didn't necessarily go about things the best. He did what at the time was seen as the best way to help the Native Americans. And that was to have them assimilate into white culture. In hindsight, many people disagree with this method, uh, but it was the prevalent idea at the time for people who actually cared about and wanted to help the Native Americans. People on the other side of the argument at the time uh, said things that were violent. They wanted to... I don't, want, I don't want to use the term exterminate because most people didn't feel that way, but they definitely wanted to get push them out, uh, as we will see in a second. So Hawkins does help uh, assimilate many of the Native Americans into the more traditionally European style of living. And he does this for about 20 years. Then so a younger generation of Native Americans decide that they don't want to assimilate. They prefer to practice their traditional ways of life that their generations of their ancestors had practiced, their religion, for lack of a better term. Uh, this disagreement between the older Cherokee, the, I'm sorry, the older Creek and the younger Creek turns violent, and it erupts into what's known as the Creek War. It's essentially a civil, civil war between the Creek Nation. Hawkins actually raises a, an outfit of Creek who are friendly to the his ideas, essentially, uh, and, and leads them a little bit, though I don't believe he actually participates in active fighting because he does want to be the peacekeeper. He does want to keep everything cool and calm as it's been for so long. He's worked so hard to keep everything on this part of the frontier very civilized in the, like, not violent term, not in the, like, assimilating term. Now, unfortunately for the Creek, this all breaks out, the Creek War breaks out while the War of 1812 is going on. And one of those guys who was more about violently getting rid of the Native Americans comes along. A gentleman many Americans admire. Uh, for many reasons, I understand it. Uh, for his treatment of the Native Americans, not so much. And that man is Andrew Jackson. Now, Andrew Jackson is not yet president of the United States. No, this is the War of 1812. Part of the way he makes his name is the Creek War. He goes and he ends the Creek War. Violently. <laughs> it's a war, and wars are violent. And Andrew Jackson puts a stop to this one. Now, unfortunately, Benjamin Hawkins wants to be there when the victorious army m makes the peace treaty that victorious armies generally do. And that's because the, Benjamin Hawkins has spent a lifetime trying to keep peace in this area. And he kind of rightfully should have been there. Uh, unfortunately for him, Andrew Jackson doesn't care about other people's feelings, if you've ever read about Andrew Jackson. And he uh, makes a very hostile... Uh, uh, treaty uh, throwing demands at the creek. Again, not trying to make judgments here, just trying to report the news. That is how it went down. Uh, Hawkins is not excited about this. Um, Andrew Jackson famously would 
about 20 years later be president of the United States and institute what became the Indian Removal Act, which became known as the Trail of Tears, uh, making the people on the side of violently force them out, victorious over the have them assimilate clan. Uh, so, and the first people Andrew Jackson relocates, one of the first tribes is, is the Creek. So vengeance is had from his perspective. Unfortunately, it is one of the more tragic historical moments in American history. Uh, and, and Benjamin Hawkins, I bring this up because Benjamin Hawkins was there for the seeds, the germination of one of those really trying times for many American peoples. Uh, in history. Of course, uh, like I said, his right idea was to have them assimilate into white culture. And, and historically, my understanding for many um, Native American nations now is they would have preferred not to have been assimilated or at least to assimilate on their own terms. Uh, so, no, in hindsight, historically, no one's really right in this scenario, but Benjamin Hawkins is definitely a little bit closer to the side of good guy. In this scenario, again, I'm not trying to throw hate at Andrew Jackson. Uh, I understand when we look at history, we have to be objective about it because almost every single person who's ever lived has done both good and terrible things. <laughs> as I understand humanity, uh, uh, and sadly for for uh, Hawkins, he passes away soon after uh, his decades of attempt at peace between the Native Americans and the Americans fails, essentially fails. So. That story of Benjamin Hawkins. As I take a sip of water, we got three guys left. Oh, we're taking, oh, taking a while on some of this. And this next one is a ton of fun. Yeah, you know this guy. Ali Hams a lot. <laughs> um, Alexander Hams. Uh, Mr. Hams is a name you probably recognize, and I could definitely talk about for hours. And I am not going to do that, I'm trying to keep this show to an hour. What I'm going to specifically focus on, as it says to my right, it's your left, whatever. It says the Camillus defense. Hamilton, with the new musical that's not new anymore, it's been around for years, has become famous as an author, as, as, an author, as a writer. Yes, Troy, the musical guy. Uh, what the musical talks about, how he wrote it, wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote, and it never once talks about the Camillus defense which is not just one paper he wrote. It's about 45 papers he wrote. Now, he wrote them with Rufus King, another very important American founder, uh, but he writes about 45 papers over the course of half a year, writing two or three a week. Hi, Pedro. Thank you for coming. Uh, yeah, they named him after the musical. Well played, Ashley. <laughs> yeah, it's a good name. I named all my kids Hamilton. <laughs> I just really like the show. Um, <laughs> so... The Camillus defense. Fast forward until the Washington administration. Hamilton is treasurer. That's pretty famous. Hamilton leaves the Washington administration before it's over. Not so famous. He leaves in 1794 or 5. Just about the time his buddy John Jay, who wrote some of the Federalist Papers also, goes to England. So John Jay is sitting Chief Justice of the United States. While he's Chief Justice, he acts as an envoy to England to negotiate a treaty with them. And while he's in England, he's elected governor of New York. John Jay's a pretty big deal. While he's in England, he negotiates this treaty. It's called Jay, the Jay Treaty, or Jay's Treaty. And it is wildly unpopular. <laughs> John Jay basically gets a treaty where the English say, fine, we'll do what we said we'd do a decade ago when we ended the war with the Treaty of Paris. Because it's, two, I guess, 11 years after the Treaty of Paris ends the war, and the English are supposed to, like, evacuate the forts, stop impressing uh, the soldiers and ships. There's a whole bunch of stuff we're not supposed to do. Uh, LBG, I see you there. I'm gonna, I'll answer your question in a second. Um, uh, John Jay comes home. And he's got this J Treaty, and he famously says he could walk from Boston to New York City by the light of his own burning effigies, because people hate it so much. Now, it does seem like it was kind of necessary to at least avoid a war with England that you just didn't want in the 1790s. Uh, and additionally, he's like, 
I worked so hard on this. <laughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> Remember, John Jay had not only been minister to Spain and signed the Treaty of Paris, but he was, for the 1780s, when the Articles of Confederation didn't really have a person, uh, any federal positions, one of the few federal positions they had was Secretary of Foreign Affairs, which for the most part was held by John Jay. And so John Jay was like kind of the guy, along with Thomas Jefferson, maybe uh, uh, John Adams. They were the three guys who actually knew how international diplomacy worked. So when John Jay comes back and says, sorry, dude, this is the best we're going to get. Uh, the, while the most people in public really hated it, the people in the Senate and House of Representatives were like, yeah, okay, we get it. So it narrowly passes, and it goes to George Washington to sign. And George Washington is like, I don't know. I'm super popular. Although, by this point, Washington's popularity has been waning a little bit because Jefferson and Adams were so mad at each other. Uh, and, uh, I'm sorry, Jefferson and Hamilton were so mad at each other. But Hamilton leaves. Washington writes to Hamilton, who just the year before had resigned his position as Secretary of the Treasury, went back to New York City because he just started a bunch of banks and the stock exchange and had a lot of money to make. <laughs> and uh, so Washington writes to Hamilton and says, hey, what do you think I should do? And Hamilton writes back and says, sign it. I'll take care of the rest. And Hamilton starts writing what's called the Camillus Defense. Now, it's spelled with a C over here because that's how he spelled it. I know that's wrong nowadays, but that is how he spelled it. The Camillus Defense is, as I said, a series of papers that he writes with uh, Rufus King in New York City outlining all the reasons we need to ratify Jay's Treaty. Now, these are not the best justifications. I'm sorry, it was 42 articles, not 45. Uh, it's not the best. Uh, I do want to note that the name Camillus, first of all, I used to live in a town called Camillus. I'm just south of it now. And Camillus seems to be, uh, Camillus seems to be, he's one of those ancient Roman generals who eventually is consul or a leader of Rome. Uh, and it, it seems that he picks this because Camillus, Camillus is able to unite both the rich and poor people, all the people of the divided Rome, fighting an outside enemy. And that's essentially what Hamilton says in these series of papers in a very small nutshell is much like we needed the Constitution to unite to deal with the outside world financially and at war, we need this treaty because it's what the rest of the world demands. It might not be the perfect thing we want, but we live in the world and we have to acknowledge what's going on out there. So we have to accept this treaty even with its major flaws because it's the best we're going to get, and it will keep us out of war. Uh, and that's essentially it. <laughs> um, again, I can go on for Hamilton all day. I do see some questions coming in. Uh, LB Girl 88 I'm not downplaying how horrific his Native American policy was, but understand that he watched his family murdered brutally and scalped as a child. No PSD or counseling then. No one cared for him. Oh, are you referencing Andrew Jackson with that, particularly? Um, yeah, I, so I, I don't know about them being scalped. So, uh, Jackson, I'm not going to get too into it, but, uh, yeah, Jackson is one of those fine line people where it's like, you could consider him a part of the American Revolution, but there's also in history books, the age of Jackson. And I feel like if you get your own age, then you're part of that and not the age before it. Um, uh, uh, his father had died from like a falling tree or something weird. Uh, and then, uh, he actually went and joined as like a 12 year old, the local militia. He, what was, I think it was William Davy. Uh, and he would like bring them water and stuff like that, do little things around camp. So when they were attacked, he was taken by a soldier and he was slashed on the face by a British soldier. And then he and his brother kept in prison for a few months until his mother is able to get him out. Uh, his brother gets super sick. Uh, his mother ends up dying, taking care of wounded soldiers thereafter. So like no one hates the British more than Andrew Jackson. Uh, so I, I don't know if the scalping, uh, but but he definitely had a firm anger for the British. He then must be brilliant because by the time he's 19, he gets a law degree and goes out to Tennessee where he's almost immediately appointed the first attorney general of the soon-to-be state. He later in his early 20s is the first and only member of the House of Representatives from Tennessee when it first becomes a state. During this time, he's on the frontier. Tennessee is the frontier, and that really seems to be where he develops a real animosity with the Native Americans. Not that he didn't grow up on the frontier of, it's called the Waxhaw. At the time, it was like questionable if it was South or North Carolina. Um, but uh, yeah, so I don't know if I'm actually uh, uh, 
deal with that, but he definitely dealt with Native Americans in war where there was scalping going on. Uh, and, and it's hard to exactly pinpoint how someone in history might come exactly come upon their hatred of a particular person. Jackson's hatred of the British is easy to pinpoint, but his hatred of the Native Americans is a little more difficult. Um, uh, Troy, was Jay the Neville Chamberlain of his time? Okay, so while I think about that, I'll tell you, uh, if you don't know, Troy's referencing World War II, or the 1930s. In the prelude to World War II, Neville Chamberlain was the uh, Prime Minister of Great Britain. Uh, and when Adolf Hitler came around and started, uh, wasn't quite Adolf Hitlering the way we remember, but really starting to be kind of a douchebag, um, uh, he, first he wanted to move into, what was it? I don't remember the order, he wanted to move into the Rhineland. And Neville Chamberlain was like, okay, you can do that, but nothing else. And then... He wanted to move into, uh, he wanted to man the armies, which Germany's, the Treaty of Versailles said, you couldn't build that big an army. And Hitler was like, I'm going to build an army. And Inver Chamberlain was like, fine, but don't do anything with it. <laughs> and then he was like, all right, I'm going to go, I'm going to go over and take Austria Hungary. Okay. Or was it, it was Czechoslovakia next. I'm sorry. I, I've spent so much time in the last few years in the American Revolution that the order of certain parts of World War II have eluded me, but you get the picture. Neville Chamberlain kept saying to Hitler, you could do that, but nothing else. Oh, okay, you can do that too, but nothing else. Oh, you want to do that? Okay, but nothing else. Uh, until he basically got kicked out of his office. Now, I don't believe, I would not call John Jay the Neville Chamberlain of his time because, uh, first of all, okay, Jay works with the Spanish for, he goes over, he's the first minister to Spain when Spain kind of almost recognized the United States, and that doesn't go well because Spain's king is kind of being a jerk about things. Um, he does sign the Treaty of Paris, so he is able to get the war ended. America officially recognized as a nation, along with John Adams and, and Benjamin Franklin, of course, and, and Henry Lawrence, who was there unofficially, uh, fresh out of the Tower of London. And then uh, he goes back, and he's minister uh, in for the ar ar under, for the under the Articles of Confederation. He's Secretary of Foreign Affairs, and he deals a lot with Spain there. Spain sends their first ministers, and it is a world of trouble. Uh, trying to get recognition, trying to get permission to trade goods on the the Mississippi River. So, uh, so no. If anything, everyone else is Neville, Neville Chamberlain giving John Jay a little bit of things, but like not enough. <laughs> like Hitler actually got things that he wanted from Chamberlain, and John Jay is kind of like, like I, I don't want to compare him to. To, you know, I probably shouldn't even say Hitler. I probably got flagged just for saying the name. Um, this is a history channel, though. Uh, we're trying to be objective here and not talking about modern politics. Uh, anyway, no, I wouldn't say that. Um, he also is it, it's, is it Pickering? He worked with Timothy Pickering on it too, who then goes to Spain, and Timothy Pickering has better luck with Spain than John Jay did. That's an interesting question. That is a very interesting comparison, Troy. I would not say quite like that because he wasn't just giving up anything because John Jay did get things in return. In fact, uh, many of the forts that were on American soil that the British had never evacuated, they did evacuate. Um, the British continued impressing soldiers on the high seas because that was almost impossible to stop for a while because it's the high seas. Uh, there were several other things. Certain debts were paid off that had never been paid off. So it, it wasn't a abject failure but it just wasn't super popular is all you know everyone wants more from their government don't they and less at the same time <laughs> uh let's see uh i'm from brazil i'm 14 years old i am subscribed the content is very epic you should have more subscribe well thank you so much tell your friends <laughs> um, we have a small channel here but a very niche one and we play trivia on friday it's gonna be late tomorrow about 9 15 but i have a little bit of an announcement tomorrow uh i have some more some new stuff coming out i'm gonna take a sip of this Hint, hint, wing, wing. Huh? No. Oh. oh. I came up with a cool design I like. You may or may not have just seen it. Am I a teacher or something? No. I'm not a morning person, so I would not be a good teacher. Um, toward the Hermitage back in the late 90s, Hatred of Native Americans was discussed. Maybe it was the family he lived with after his mother's death. Oh. That's a good point, because he lived with, like, cousins, I believe, for a while, who... Um, uh, uh, helped him get his education. Uh, was the reason given that adoptive Native American was the reason that he was the reason given that he adopted the Native American's little boy and raised him as his own? Knew he had a little boy. Must have been. Oh, that's right. I almost forgot. You know, I don't know a ton about Andrew Jackson. I'll be honest. Like I know 
more about him in the American Revolution and I know about his presidency. His personal life I never got too into. Uh, obviously, I spent a lot of time in the Revolution. Uh, but you're right. He did adopt a Native American boy, didn't he? You know, again, this is, anything I say now is kind of um, speculation. But uh, it certainly seems to me, at least on the, on the face of it, that uh, Jackson wasn't... seems that most of what he doesn't like about the Native Americans is that the Native Americans were sided with the British in the Revolution. And you just shouldn't do that. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean he didn't have... I want to say sympathy, but truthfully, the word is probably pity. He probably did pity the Native Americans. Uh, racism wasn't a thing then. It wasn't a word they had. Uh, but it certainly was real. And he definitely looked down on... The same way, as I mentioned earlier, the same way you looked at uh, black people as, as specifically enslaved people, as people who needed to be taken care of, like a child, uh, the Native Americans were kind of lower than that. Like, even in the Constitution, uh, they, you know, we talk about the, oh, my bit rate's a little low, sorry about that. Uh, even in the Constitution, we talk about the three-fifths clause and how black people were only three-fifths of a person. That same clause says excluding savages, <laughs> um, which is tough to hear, but a good way to view um how they looked at things at the time so uh, again we're getting a little off track here i appreciate it. i love it i would love to answer every question so keep them coming um but he did adopt a native american boy uh, and it seemed like you know that one got assimilated i guess assimilation was okay with that child <laughs> um and and i should before we move on remind you that every american founder is a different human being that had slightly different views just like every american be every human being now also has slightly different views than everyone else. It is telling me my, bit, my, my, my audio might be a little not super great. Uh, please let me know if I'm having any troubles. I'll see if I can correct it. I am using a different program than usual, so we're going with it. Uh, LB Girl 88 uh, thank you for loving my channel. I love that you're watching. <laughs> okay. Uh, so let's move on from Hamilton. We can stay. You know, it's funny. When I started this episode, I thought we'd be talking about Hamilton for a very long time. I did not really think that a, an offhand comment about Andrew Jackson would lead to so much. But I absolutely love it. It's great. It's so much fun. Speaking of people, uh, 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 Lemuel Haynes. Lemuel Haynes is one of the most success successful persons of color during the American Revolution. Uh, Ashley, thank you so much. You're always prompt. I love your help. Uh, Lemuel Haynes. I hope I'm pronouncing that first name right. And that time I didn't. Easy for me to say. Lemuel Haynes was born to a black father and a white mother in Hartford, Connecticut. Now, we don't know a ton about his early life. His father's identity is unknown. And his mother's identity is murky. We do believe we know who she is, but it's a little bit... Maybe? So, uh, he is indentured to a, uh, a a preacher named David Rose. Now, I need to make a time out here and make a, a Schitt's Creek joke because David Rose is the star of the show Schitt's Creek, the famous Canadian show, which if you have not watched it, you might enjoy it. It's got a lot of that old-timey humor. I mean, Eugene Levy is one of the stars of it, and it's his son that writes it. So it's got that old-timey kind of SNL 1970s, 80s vibe. I love it. Uh, now that that's out of the way, this David Rose lived hundreds of years ago, and he took in Lemuel Haynes as a young man, as a boy, essentially. Uh, what's interesting about their indenture, and I'll remind you, um, indentured servitude was something that both black and white people did. Uh, it was for a limited amount of time, usually seven years. You would be signed on. You'd essentially be, you wouldn't be a slave, but in everything but name to a person. Uh, you would work for them to help them, and when you were done, you were some, they, you either got paid or whatever. Now, part of Lemuel Haynes' agreement was that he would be educated by this preacher, David Rose. He was educated by this preacher. And in fact, at, at, when he graduates, he starts to, or when he graduates, when his indenture is completed, he does start to study. But he also joins the local Massachusetts militia. And when Lexington and Concord breaks out, he joins the fight. He goes to uh, Boston during the siege of Boston. Soon thereafter, Fort Ticonderoga is captured, and Lemuel Haynes is one of the people sent actually to sit in Fort Ticonderoga in 1775 when nothing was going on there. So he was supposed to defend a fort there. This was not going to be under attack, because I'll remind you, 
most of the British army was in Boston surrounded by Patriots, and the other rest of the Patriots were going into Canada to try and invade it, unsuccessfully. Fascinating, <laughs> Lemuel Haynes is there, and while he's there, under this in this fort that's not under siege, he gets sick. And he gets so sick he has to actually leave the army. Now, when he does this, he starts to study. He himself becomes a Congregationalist preacher, just as the American Revolution ends. Excuse me. He preaches for several years in Connecticut, where he studied, before moving to Vermont. He moves to the Vermont frontier. The town is called uh, Rutland. And he spends 33 years as the preacher in Rutland, Vermont, where he marries and has 10 children. For the most part, he preaches to a primarily white congregation, which is fascinating. Uh, now, he, uh, as you can see from the image next to me, uh, he does have more fair skin uh, than many other people, persons of color. However, uh, he is a black person under the rules of the law. But still, Vermont seems to be pretty cool, and they uh, attend his congregation for 33 years. Now, during this time, well, Lemuel starts talking about emancipation. Actually, the word at the time is abolition. Actually, the word at the time is manumission, but he's one of the first people to really start talking about it because 33 years is a long time, and he's around when the abolitionist movement starts coming around. So he starts calling it manumission and then transitions into the abolitionist phase of the what would eventually be emancipation. Sorry, it's a lot of word lingo, whatever. Uh, but Haynes uh, is one of the early people doing it, and to be a black guy standing in front of a crowd of 100 white people saying we should get rid of slavery uh, speaks a lot to his courage, speaks a lot to that community in Vermont to accept that kind of language at the time. Uh, now, Lemuel eventually leaves there and moves to upstate New York about, I mean, probably an hour's drive away nowadays. Uh, and while he's there, he's awarded... Oh, let me go back. When he becomes a preacher, this is the most important part, I skip right over it. When he becomes a preacher, at the time, you had to be licensed to become a preacher. You didn't need a license to be a doctor, but being, religion was so important, you needed a license. The government had to verify that you knew what you were doing, if you were going to say you're a man of God. Uh, Lemuel Haynes is the first person in the United States of America, the first person of color in the United States, to be given a license to preach. And that's an extraordinary achievement. Now, I skipped that and went through the rest of his life, but then he moves to New York when there's a new university called Middlebury College, and they give him an honorary master's degree. And he also becomes the first person of color in the history of the United States to receive a master's in higher education. It's kind of astonishing that we don't hear about the name Lemuel Haynes as often as we used to. Or, uh, not that we ever did, but as often as we should. Uh, this gentleman to my side is really, I don't, I don't even have the words to describe it. Uh, his accomplishments are, are extraordinary and, and really should be um, boasted about. Uh, and now, that's it. <laughs> so I'm pretty much at the end. Is there anything else I left out? No. Any questions, let me know. Uh, sorry, I skipped the good part. <laughs> I saved it for the end. Uh, we have run over it. We're over an hour. This is going to be a longer episode than usual. We have one more person. Uh, I'm getting a little sweaty because, as usual, I have to turn my AC off when I shoot these videos or it's too loud. But I, ha I have to keep up the flannels or my look that I've gone with, and I can't give up on them now, no matter how hot it might be. Um, let's get to this last person. Uh, to my, again, you're watching me, so it's my left. Is that my left? Feels like my right, but it's your left. Whatever. Kate Barry. Full name, Catherine Moore Barry. Troy, coming in with a question. Preaching was the Twitter of the 18th century, so there you got to have full conversations in the 18th century. Uh, it wasn't even like telegrams could be considered. Like, <laughs> you had to write a full letter to someone. Uh, but yes, preaching... I see what you're saying, Troy. Like, preaching certainly was the, um... No, because anyone can be on Twitter. You needed a license to preach. You know, I, 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 I'm having... I'm at a loss for a modern comparison to how important preaching was to everyday life. 
because when you lived in a small town like this, you worked on your farm one, maybe two days a week, you'd go sell your wares in the village. Uh, and Sundays you'd go to church and that's when you saw people. And the preacher was the leader of the town, every town. I want to say all across the United States with very few exceptions. Uh, you know, like it's, it's, it's not even like Twitter is to the modern population. It's like, what's the guy's name? I don't remember his name. Okay, let's go for Facebook. <laughs> um, it's like Zuckerberg is to Facebook. The way he runs that show more than it is Facebook is to everyone else. Uh, he really ran the whole thing. Preacher had a wide audience. Okay, fair enough. Fair enough, yes. Yes, well, because they would also publish often too. Their sermons would get published. So you're right. They would reach a much wider audience. Compared to everyone else who reached absolutely no audience. <laughs> kind of like my show. I just got this group of friends that comes and hangs out like you guys. Thank you so much. Hit like, subscribe. <laughs> All right, Kate Barry. So Catherine Moore Barry uh, lived on a plantation in South Carolina. Again, another slave owner. Uh, though we could probably blame her husband mostly for that. She was a homemaker for all intents and purposes. Her husband goes and joins the Continental Army. And Kate is home. And somehow she gets information. Now, I am fuzzy on how she actually finds out this information. But she finds out that Lord Cornwallis is sending Bannister Tongue to launch a surprise attack on an outfit of patriots. And Kate Barry says, no, not on my watch. And as the story goes, she ties her toddler to a bedpost so it stays out of trouble and gets on horseback and rides away to warn the Patriots. Now, that whole toddler thing, I have a strong inclination, is probably garbage. Uh, as I said, she had a plantation. She probably left it with her servants. <laughs> um, uh, but let's just pretend she ties the baby to the bed and gets on her horse. Now, she's able to beat Bannister Charlton and his men to the Patriot camp because she is familiar with the area and she knows the old Native American trails and she's able to ride this to get there first. Now, who did she show up and warn? Time out. First of all, a lot of stories about women at the time are very hard to corroborate. I like the tying the baby to the bedpost part. But we do know that Catherine Barry did ride and warn the Patriots of this impending attack. And the Patriot she warned was Daniel Morgan, known for his riflemen. So Morgan, uh, what follows is the battle of, not, I always want to say camp, Cowpens, not Camden, Cowpens, what follows the battle of Cowpens. Kate Barry warns them and rides away. And that's essentially the end of Kate Barry's story. But I do want to focus for just a minute on the battle of Cowpens itself. Had Daniel Morgan been surprised by Bannister Talton, who was known for being an extremely good, if maybe a little aggressive commander, uh, if he was taken by surprise, the entire American Revolution could have come out differently. Because Morgan is ready for a man who thinks he's launching a surprise attack. Uh, when you reverse ambush someone, it can really work in your benefit. This is in South Carolina. This is as Nathaniel Green is racing to the Dan, as it's called. He's basically got, at this point, Nathaniel Green has taken almost the entire let's say two-thirds approximately of the Continental Army in the south back up to Virginia running and hiding while most of the British are chasing him but Nathaniel Green was smart enough to break off gigantic sections of his army so they couldn't all be captured at once and Daniel Morgan is put in charge of this section and that's why it's so important that Kate Barry informs Morgan that this is happening Morgan is ready for Bannister Tarleton, and what ensues is what's often called, and now I'm not a military historian, but military historians do call this one of the only strategically innovative moves in the American Revolution on either side. What, what Morgan does is when Tarleton arrives, Morgan positions his men on a slight hill, and he has three sets of men. He has militia, which are raised from the people, he has Continental Army soldiers, and he has riflemen, Morgan's riflemen. So, first, Morgan sends out the militia. Now, the militia are not well-trained at all, and they're known to be skittish. So they run out and get shot at by the British. So they get scared and run away. At least that's what they're demonstrating to the enemy. They run away behind the hill, and the Continental Army comes down. 
and then the British start moving forward, and the Continental Army pretend to get scared. So the British go, whoa, we're doing it. Now, we knew we'd scare the militia, but we're scaring the Continentals. Let's go. And they start moving forward, and they get disorganized. And that's when Morgan's riflemen come up from over the hill. Now, Morgan's riflemen at this point have made a name for themselves. The rifle was a fairly new weapon, mostly used on the frontier. And what differentiates the rifle from other weapons is that it had curves inside of the barrel. So when you shot the gun, it would spin the bullet, kind of like throwing a football with a spiral. It gave it more accuracy at a much greater distance. So when Morgan's riflemen come over, the British are like, oh, no. <laughs> and when Morgan's riflemen start picking them off, at the same time, you have the Continental soldiers turn around and come back down the hill, and you have the militiamen who ran behind the hill come out around. And now these disorganized Brits are up on the hill getting picked off by the riflemen while the Continental Army comes down the hill and the militia come around and encircle them. And the Battle of Calpens is an outstanding victory for the Americans. It's one of the more important victories in the war because this is a big chunk of the British army that's just been defeated. And Green's about to start chasing Cornwallis back down south. And Morgan's about to go and meet him, and they're going to bring Cornwallis to Yorktown. And if this battle ends differently, then Cornwallis may never be cornered in Yorktown. Then Green may never be able to chase him at all. In a large part of the, or I'll say, a small but significant part of the victory in the American Revolution goes to Kate Barry for her foresight to take those Native American trails to Daniel Morgan in the days before the Battle of Cowpens. So I see some questions coming in. If you got some questions, throw them in now and we'll call it a night. Uh, Morgan has a fascinating life too. Thanks for helping him out, Kate Barry. Morgan has a very fascinating life. Uh, I skipped a big part of it, but his riflemen are very important. He's actually from the frontier. It's interesting, in the early days of the American Revolution, uh, they choose George Washington as a commander-in-chief, largely to get people from the South to go up to New England to help with this whole fiasco in Boston. Uh, and they don't get a lot of... It's hard to get people to say, yeah, I'll join a war in Boston. I'll walk. Because they don't have horses. I'll walk a thousand miles to Boston. Because you guys... Because you guys threw some tea in the harbor? <laughs> Daniel Morgan is on the frontier. Pennsylvania, Kentucky area. He leads his riflemen to Boston and joins the Continental Army. They end up going up through the invasion of Canada. Morgan's captured. Uh, Morgan actually takes over, uh, kind of comes into command during the failed Battle of Quebec. Uh, and then he, yeah, he spends the whole, he gets captured and then gets released and just a really fun story. You're right, Troy. It's a really fun story. I'm not going to get too much to it now. We went way off topic with Andrew Jackson for a while, and we are 17 minutes over our normally scheduled uh, discussion. And I have to go shoot the video for tomorrow's uh, in uh, a Federal Farmer. I wrote the article earlier. i got to shoot the video, which I know you enjoy, Troy. Uh, that will be out tomorrow. Uh, again, tomorrow we are going to do uh, late. We have some. I keep having scheduling conflicts on Friday when we're supposed to be doing trivia. I'm going to do trivia late. About 9.15 should be the targeted time. Uh, and just so you know, I am going to be making announcements there. Uh, and then with my emails on Sunday. If you're not subscribed to my email, subscribe on Sunday. And it might have something to do with a new product that I'm making a big deal about drinking out of right now. And is putting me out of focus, huh? I came up with a cool design. And I'm going to share with you guys. I hope you like it. Ashley, you're the best. Troy, everyone else watching. Pedro, uh, LBG, LB Girl 88. I keep thinking you're LBG Earl. <laughs> I know it's not right. It's probably because I just rewatched My Name is Earl recently. It's a fun show. Not the best, but it's fun. I'm going to get out of here. You guys are amazing. And as always, I am going to leave you with Round Bottom.